Hey folks, we're going to be reading The Wife's Lament, uh, translated by Anne Stanford. Um, this poem was originally written in Anglo-Saxon by a uh, you know priest, uh, a Catholic monk, um, and that's a recording we have. It exists in a book called the Exeter Book. Um, you know, we assume that even though this poem is uh, narrated from a female perspective, it's unique in that sense. Um, it's it's the only thing uh, from the Anglo-Saxon times that's from a female perspective that it was probably written by a male monk. Um, and so there's there's a little bit of interesting stuff there. Although I suppose it could have been written by a a um, a nun, a female. Um, but generally speaking, males are the only ones who are taught how to read and write. Um, and so it would be more common uh, for, for males to have reading and writing ability um, back in the time when this was written. Um, first thing you want to do when you get a poem uh, to look at is, is to look at the title. Uh, this one's called The Wife's Lament. So let's unpack the title for a second. Um, you know, The Wife's Lament. So we know that the main character is female. Uh, she's a wife. That tells us she's female, but it also tells us she's married. Uh, and lament is a word that means sorrow or sadness. So this poem is essentially the the wife's sorrow, the wife's sadness. Um, and that's that gives us a sort of a preface. The, the main character is going to be sad. Um, it's also going to be allegorical, and we're going to want to pay attention to that. I'm going to read it to you, but I'm not going to stop and, and spend a lot of time on literary terms. Um, I'm mostly going to read it to you, but I need to provide a little bit of background to help you understand uh, what's going on, because this poem also, as well as being um, from a female point of view, is also sort of out of chronological order. A lot of the stories that we've read so far have sort of stayed chronological, uh, but this one jumps around. It's almost like it's at, at you know, one point in her life, and then it goes to another point in her life, and then it goes back to this other point, and, you know, like, so there's there's a little bit of time travel flashbacks flash forwards and stuff like that going on in this poem that makes it complex and can be confusing if you don't understand sort of the underlying story so uh here's a little bit for historical context um it's called the wife's lament it's it's written about um the wife of a lord a guy who's uh somebody powerful uh during anglo-saxon times we don't know who this lord is we don't know who the wife is they're they're just referred to as the wife and the lord um the only other character in here is the kinsman um, but you need to know a little bit about how, how weddings went back then and marriages for, um, the wealthy. Essentially, uh, if you're a king or a lord and, um, you have a daughter, uh, that daughter would be married as part of a political arrangement. Um, it's, we're not talking about like she gets, everybody's like, oh, I want to be a princess. Uh, but back in Anglo-Saxon times, being a princess was not great. Uh, the reality is that you're a political token. So essentially what happens is, you know, let's say you're a lord and your, your dad dies. And so you become lord of wherever it is that you're, um, in charge of well your first and primary responsibility as a lord is to have a son you got to have a male heir because if you don't there's a power vacuum when you die and then um you end up uh you know with bad things happening like civil wars and stuff like that and people people want to avoid that and so um you got to have a male heir. In order to have a male heir, you've got to be married. Well, if you're going to get married, you've got to marry somebody who's of equal social status to you. And you want to marry somebody who is going to help your country. And so generally speaking, you look for um, the daughter of a neighboring king that you want to make an alliance with who's about the right age and who can bear you a son. And so essentially what would happen, let's, let's just assume there's a young lord uh, who's looking to get married and he sends a messenger to his neighbor to the south who's an older guy who has a daughter who's about the right age. Now by about the right age, um, girls got married as young as like 13, uh, which is horrifying today. Um, but back then, you know, like they didn't really care. They just did it. Um, so if she's generally between 13 and like 18, she's prime marriageable material. Once you get over 18, we're talking, you know, getting old. Because remember, in Anglo-Saxon times, people lived to be about 27 on average. Now, the rich tended to live longer because they had better health care and better food and, you know, like stuff like that. But anyway, you'd send a message, uh, a messenger to, to this lord. In this case, maybe your brother, uh, somebody you trust. And he'd go to this other king and he'd say, hey, I hear you have a daughter. Um, you know, Lord, I got to give these people names or I'm going to get lost. Uh, Lord Bjorn, uh, wants to marry your daughter. And so, um, the King, you know, would agree or not agree, but usually he'd agree. And so, um, you know, this brother of, of Lord Bjorn would, um, check the daughter out, make sure she wasn't like 
you know, deformed or, or looking like she wouldn't be able to bear children or, um, you know, something else. And then he'd go back to his brother and say, okay, the marriage is good. So now um, Lord Bjorn has to get in the boat uh, with his, his best warriors dressed in their finest armor and sail over to this other king's place uh, for the marriage ceremony. We still do this, by the way. The marriage is still traditionally supposed to take place in the town of the woman. Um, and so he would sail there. And a lot of times, um, and this is in a lot of old chronicles and stories, it would be a trap. The wedding, you know, like like the Red Wedding in Game of Thrones uh, would be a trap. And so the guy would bring groomsmen with him. The groomsmen were his best warriors in their best armor. And we echo that even today where you have these groomsmen who, who dress up in sort of fancy attire. Obviously, we don't wear armor anymore because you don't have to fight your way out of a trap if it's a trap. Um, but yeah, he'd sail over there and then he'd meet this girl for the first time on the day that they're getting married. They'd have a wedding ceremony. She'd have a maid of honor. Um, you know, the maid of honor was generally her younger sister and, uh, he would have a um, best man and the best man would generally be his younger brother. And the idea here is if something were to happen to either of, of the two people who are getting married, like she got sick and died or, um, got pregnant or he, you know, got cold feet and ran away. Well, then the best man would have to marry, the the woman or if the woman something happened to her then you know he'd be marrying her uh maid of honor and that way the the political alliance would still be going through anyway that that's all unimportant i think to the poem but it's good context to understand the society what happens is uh, these two get married and then she has to get on his ship and sail back to his his country um you know and she leaves behind her family and everybody she knows, she can't read and write. There's no communicating. She might take a servant or two with her. But essentially, um, it's a lot like going into exile. She she has to leave her whole world behind and go with this new guy who she just married, who she just met, and move into his house and his country and, and live there. So in the case of this poem, that's sort of the background you need to know. Um, now, imagine, and I think we've all had this experience, have you or a sibling ever dated somebody that your entire family hates that ever happen uh doesn't get along with wants the relationship to end that's essentially what happens in this poem imagine you marry somebody and you like them uh and you have to go over to their their country and live there and it turns out that all of their relatives all their kinspeople uh hate you uh and that's that's sort of the situation so to give you a little bit more on this um you know back in the day viking lords you know in in the summer they would go off raiding um they get in their ships and they they were often called sea kings and they'd they'd sail around with sort of fleets and and do raiding and stuff like that and so she marries this guy and they have a great winter and they're happy and they're well matched together but the family hates her and in the spring he gets on his ship and sails away and then you know his family maybe his brother um all the people who are left behind they start uh plotting against her um, they start telling him, for example, that she's cheating on him. Um, now, back in the day, uh, if a queen cheated on the king, um, that was usually punishable by death. Most uh, most historical sources, you know, say that that either she would be burned at the stake. That was a traditional punishment for women who cheated um, on lords and kings or stoned to death basically you're, you're put out in the street naked and everybody chucks stones at you until you die um both of those are horrifying punishments the reason that they are horrifying punishments is if you're the queen and you cheat on the king then the kid that you have is not of noble birth and so you end up with succession problems again you know like who's going to be king after this person dies we're going to have a civil war and that's kind of a big deal and so that was that was often the punishment now it is not a fair society uh the reality is that if the king cheats on the queen nobody cares uh they just have a child and that child's called a bastard and they're not officially able to inherit the throne uh but back to our story uh everybody in town is or not everybody, but the, the family of the Lord is sending him messages that um, his wife is cheating on him. And then, you know, we get this question, who do you believe? Do you believe your wife, who you just met six months ago, or do you believe your brother that you fought side by side in battle for? You know, bros before women of questionable morality. Or, you know, like, oh, by the way, I'm married. You always believe your wife. It's always it's always the best policy to do that. Um, but in this case, you know, it's it's a difficult situation. 
So uh, he's sad across the ocean fighting his campaigns because he thinks his wife's cheating on him. And she's sad uh, back in her homeland because she can't do anything. She doesn't have any way to reach her husband. She can't write. She can't read. She can't communicate with him. She's got no friends. Uh, how does she tell him that this is not happening? And do we know that it's not happening? I mean, I guess you have to use a poem for context. Um, anyway, the Lord comes back. And theoretically, if he believes that she's been cheating on him, he should kill her, um, you know, in, in one of the two punishment ways. But he decides he can't do that. He sees her and he still loves her, uh, but he feels like he can't be with her because he can't trust her. And so he decides he's going to banish her. So she's going to be in exile. She's going to go into exile. Um, so he exiles her in this sort of weird way to go live in the woods underneath this this oak tree. Um you know, and so she's sort of like Keebler elf exiled out into the woods under this tree uh, where she has to live without him for the rest of her life. And uh, she's sad and sorrowful and uh, ultimately wishes on him sort of the same thing that he's done to her, that he himself will become an exile one day. Um, and that's sort of the plot line of the poem if you want to follow it through. Um, that's a surface level of the poem. Remember, the poem's going to be allegorical. All of these characters are going to represent something uh, more than themselves. But that, that gives you enough to go on, I think, so that you can understand what's going on here. So I'm going to read you the poem. I'm not going to stop to do a lot of analysis or, or anything like that, because I want you uh, to be able to do that analysis yourself. Uh, you probably hear my dog growling. Hopefully she doesn't start barking, but I'm out on the back deck, you know. It's one of the last nice days. It's getting colder, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to enjoy this while I can. Uh, and hopefully you are, too. Maybe you're watching it in a nice location. Um, so, uh, I'm going to read you this poem, The Wife's Lament by Anne Stafford, or translated by Anne Stanford. And, uh, you know, just listen up um, or read it on your own. At this point, you can just pause the video and read it on your own if you'd rather do that. Uh, and that's fine as well. The Wife's Lament. I make this song about me full sadly. My own wayfaring. I, a woman, tell what griefs I had since I grew up. Old, new or old, never more than now. Ever I know the dark of my exile. First, my Lord went out, away from his people. Over the wave tumult, I grieved each dawn, wondered where my Lord, my first on earth, might be. Then I went forth, a friendless exile, to seek service in my sorrow's need. My man's kinsmen began to plot by darkened thought, to divide us two. So we most widely in the world's kingdom lived wretchedly, and I suffered longing. My Lord commanded me to move my dwelling here. I had few loved ones in this land or faithful friends. For this my heart grieves, that I should find the man well matched to me, hard of fortune, mournful of mind, hiding his mood, thinking of murder. That escalated quickly. Blythe was our bearing. Often we vowed that but death alone would part us too, naught else. But this is turned round now, as if it never were. Our friendship. I must far and near bear the anger of my beloved. The man sent me out to live in the woods, under an oak tree, in this den in the earth. Ancient this earth hall, I am all longing. The valleys are dark, the hills high, the yard overgrown, bitter with briars, a joyless dwelling. Full oft the lack of my lord seizes me cruelly here. Friends there are on earth, living beloved, lying in bed, while I at dawn am waking alone under the oak tree, through these earth halls. There may I sit the summer long day, there I can weep over my exile, my many hardships. Hence I may not rest from this care of heart which belongs to me ever, nor all this longing that has caught me in this life. May that young man be sad-minded always, hard his heart's thought, while he must wear a blithe bearing, with care in the breast, a crowd of sorrows, may on himself depend all his world's joy. Be he outlawed far in a strange folk land, that my beloved sits under a rocky cliff, rhymed with frost, a lord dreary in spirit, 
drenched with water in a ruined hall. My Lord endures much care of mind. He remembers too often a happier dwelling. Woe be to them that for a loved one must wait in longing. All right, use that and go answer the worksheet. See how many terms you can identify and make sense of. Um, and we'll see where we're at as a class with our understanding of the terminology and the poetry before we move on to Beowulf next time.